From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. My name is Don Van Zant. This is the Lost Mission Podcast, uh, where our goal is to help us believers get back to our mission of knowing and sharing the gospel. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, we just want to make disciples. <laughs> that's 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 what we want to do. And when we were reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 just now, I think that's the heart of Paul. That's the heart of the apostle. And discipleship is so important. Knowing Christ, going deeper in Christ, growing in our walk with the Lord. That's that's what this show is about. That's what we want to do. But this is our series on holiness. We are pursuing holiness with Jerry Bridges. We're going through his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, which I actually have back there behind me on the desk. I'm not going to turn around and grab it, but um, it's a wonderful book, and I highly recommend it. However, in today's episode, we're going to start going through chapter four um, and deal with a very, very important aspect and issue of holiness. So right now, if I were to ask you as a Christian, what is the single most important thing to consider when we consider holiness? What would what would you say? What would that be? Would it be the length of your hair? Would it be the type of outward um, apparel that you are wearing? Would it be your pants? Would it be your dress? Would it be uh, facial hair or the lack thereof? Would it be the amount of jewelry that you wear, the lack thereof? Would it would it be the version of the Bible that you read? Would it be the amount of time you spend in prayer? Would it be the way that you spend that time in prayer? Would it be how much you worship? Would it be the manner in which you worship? Would it be the level or degree of excitement or the lack thereof? Would you would you prefer a more liturgical approach? and style of worship, or would you like things to be just kind of however we do it, and whatever happens, happens, we leave that up to the Spirit of the Lord. If I asked you about holiness, would it be in the preaching? Would it be in the teaching? What would be your answer, the single most important thing to consider when we consider holiness? Would it be a theological answer? Would it be practical? Everything that I just said is vital, Everything that I just said is important, and we ought to consider every single one of those things. They're important when we consider holiness. That said, none of those are of the greatest of value or of importance. The single most important thing to consider when we consider holiness is the holiness of Christ. Because if our holiness isn't centered on and, and built around Jesus Christ, I would venture to say that, that we have no holiness at all. If, if we're not really focused on the authority of Christ in our lives and the holiness of Christ expressed through us, are we truly ambassadors of and representatives of Christ? If we're not pointing everything back to Him, can we really claim that we are holy? Can we? All right, well, let's talk about the holiness of Christ today, coming from chapter 4 of Jerry Bridges' book. Um, He has this to say in the very beginning of the chapter, possibly the most important factor to consider uh, when we discuss holiness is the holiness of Christ. Before we can consider our own personal holiness, we must consider the holiness of Christ. So that's what we're going to talk about today, is the holiness of 
Christ. And, and, and obviously, we're coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It is a very powerful chapter. 2 Corinthians is probably, um, of the two uh, Corinthian epistles that we have from Paul, 2 Corinthians is the most difficult to work through. It doesn't have the same amount of cohesion that 1 Corinthians does. But but once we get into the, the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, um, Paul Paul's going to... Uh, He's, he's going he's gonna to deal with some pretty interesting things, uh, some, some pretty deep spiritual and um, theological issues. So when we think of the, of, of the chapter, before I get into the context of today's topic, let's talk a little bit about the chapter, establish some context to see where, where we're coming from, all right? So the chapter is divided up into two sections, if you will, two, two pericopes, if we could say it that way. Um, and, and, and like I said, it's kind of a difficult passage uh, to understand, but it's very beautiful at the same time. And the gist of the chapter is something like this. Our bodies, this, this temple, um, is sinful. They're, they're sinful bodies. This is a sinful flesh. Um, but in Christ, this sinful flesh becomes a holy thing. So the first portion of the chapter, the first pericope, the first 10 verses or so, uh, deal with the frailty of the human body, both physically and spiritually. And I would really hope that we could all agree that these bodies are frail, uh, they get tired, they find themselves exhausted, we get sick, and eventually we age and we die. <laughs> the human body doesn't have really all that, that splendid of a story to tell to us. Uh, Paul actually talks about that. Uh, chapter 5, verse 2, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on that heavenly dwelling. He's making these comparisons between the Old Testament tabernacle and the temple and referring that back to our bodies, our bodies being the new temple, uh, that third temple of, of Christ, if I could put it that way. So uh, verse 2, in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Uh, verses 6 and 7, we are always of good courage. And we know that we're, while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that one may receive what is due uh, for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And for the Christian, that gives us great hope when we know that we stand before God and, and are judged by him, uh, that, that we have no reason really to fear, no, no reason to, to wonder. So that's the first half. It deals with our body as, as a tabernacle and as a tent um, and as a temple and talks about how the, this body is frail and it longs to be uh, with Christ. The second half, the second pericope of the chapter, uh, verses 11 through 21, uh, deal with this uh, earthly body uh, being reconciled with Christ's holiness. So down here, while we are in this flesh, being reconciled with the holiness of Christ until the time when our bodies are raised, eternal, and this old man puts on the new man, and we go, and we have a glorified body uh, with Christ. Read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but that's not what this show's about today. A few verses, though, from the latter portion of the chapter. <laughs> We're not commending ourselves to you again, uh, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance <laughs> and not about what is in the heart. <laughs> I find that very interesting that Paul takes some time to just point that out, those that boast about outward appearance. Just so you know, the outward appearance has little to possibly nothing to do with the holiness of the individual. I, I think that, that we should worry about our outward appearance. Uh, we should care about those things, but those things are not what makes us more or less godly. Christ is the thing that makes us more or less <laughs> godly if we have him or if we don't. And, and finally, that, that penultimate verse of the chapter is so powerful and so wonderful, and I've quoted it. I'm certain if you have done much of any personal evangelism, you also have quoted this verse. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's already come upon him. So Paul's dealing with all of this contrast, this back and forth, back and forth between what this body is, and how unholy it is, and how the outward appearance really can't do much to affect that. Uh, but it's Christ. And when we come into Christ, the old man is put away and we put on the new man. And then it gets to verse 21, the, the last verse of the chapter, and the emphasis becomes somewhat dual, um, two-part. Jesus became what he should not, 
so that we might become what we could not. Right? He became what he should not so that we could become what we could not. He became sin. We became the righteousness of God. That's wonderful, and it thrills my heart to know the beauty of individual salvation. It's just summed up in that verse that Jesus became what he didn't have to become so that I could become something that I could not ever become. The holiness of Christ expressed through us. And that's beautiful, powerful, and wonderful. And Jerry Bridges does an excellent, (laughs) excellent job of discussing that very matter in this chapter. So let me just tell you, that was something in my life I really struggled with for years, for a very long time. I wanted to be holy. I mean, just just as I'm sure that, that many of you likewise desire to be holy. You want to be holy because you realize God's holy. So I thought, man, I really got to do, I got to clock in and do my job and be holy. And I didn't realize that my righteousness was not because of anything I could ever do. It was because of the righteousness of Christ in me. Think back to Romans chapter 4, that beautiful uh, faith-based chapter where it speaks of Abraham and his faith. Um, and it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, what does the Scripture say? Paul's referring back to the, to the Scripture. Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God, and that's what was counted to him as righteousness. So in our lives, believing God is what counts for righteousness, not deeds. Believing God is what counts for righteousness. Now, deeds matter. They do. And I just don't have time to get into that in this episode. But before we can focus on our deeds... We have to focus on the holiness of Christ. Christ was never sinful, but he became sin. We are always sinful, but we became holy. And this was all due to Christ's holiness. All right. So uh, the holiness of Christ, let's, let's think through this a little bit. And how should we feel about it? What should we think? Well, number one, the scripture speak of the holiness of Christ. I would hope that there are no Christians out there that would dispute this. Now look, I know that there is an element of maybe progressive Christianity and pagan religion and those that but in the mainstream orthodox Christian faith, I think the holiness of Christ is pretty well attested that we accept that. So I'm not going to try to make a case for the holiness of Christ. I'm not going to try to convince you that Christ was sinless. I if you're listening to this show or watching this video, I'm going to go ahead and and trust that you already believe that and have confidence that you do, and we'll work quickly through a few scriptures. I'm not trying to make an apologetic for that. I'm really not. I'm trusting you already think that. All right. Uh, Feel free to pause the video. Do more research on your own if you're struggling with this. If you wonder, is Jesus really holy? Was he all these things that that I've been led to believe? Here's a few verses that might can help you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, he is described as being without sin, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This isn't to get into the whole peccability versus impeccability of Christ argument. I think it's a foolish one to have and is of no benefit in the first place. The fact is Christ was perfect and without sin. Um, scripture describes him as one who committed no sin. First Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, speaking of Christ. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 that we just read, um, he is described as one who had no sin. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Uh, and the, the Apostle John um, states that in him is no sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. Christ came to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. The Old Testament describes him prophetically as the righteous servant, Isaiah 53. Uh, Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one see. My servant make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquity. So he is the righteous servant. God calls him my servant, the righteous one. He is a righteous servant. Uh, Psalm 54 uh, speaks of Christ, says that he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So um, we can see in both Old and New Testaments 
that when Messiah would come and after he did come, that he would be a man that loved righteousness and hated iniquity and one that was righteous in our place because you and I, brother, we're not that guy. <laughs> the holiness of Christ. Uh, Christ also spoke of his own holiness. He really did. And he lived it out. So nowhere in Scripture does Christ, nowhere in the four Gospels, throughout the book of Acts, anywhere else, when Christ speaks, does he refer to himself um, as less than holy. He never says that. He never says that he is not holy. Now, what we would consider holy men of old do. Remember Isaiah? Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Jesus never says that about himself. You will not see him bowing in fear before angels uh, or crying out, woe is me. Uh, Christ has no issue declaring his own holiness. He was holy in every way. Let me just sidebar, <laughs> Let me just sidebar right there and give you my commentary a little bit. I really have a problem <laughs> when, when, when people declare their own holiness so much rather than their own wretchedness. Uh, Christ declares his holiness, but great, holy, righteous men declare their filth and an unrighteousness before God. So if you go around a person who's constantly proclaiming themselves, I am holy, 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 <sighs> just remember that we are fleshly, sinful men, and we're taking the place of Christ if we go around proclaiming ourselves to be holy all the time. <clears throat> all right, let's, 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 let's think about a setting of Scripture. Speaking of Christ and His holiness, remember John chapter 8, uh, Christ is dealing with the sort of air quotes believing Jews, <laughs> the scripture calls them believing Jews, we'll find out later that they really weren't, um, so their their belief was at least misappropriated or was misguided in some way, they really didn't believe Jesus. <laughs> um, he's disputing with these believing Jews over his father, and the Jews make the claim that Abraham is their father and that Jesus is born of sexual immorality or even a fornic fornication. They make a dig at Christ. <laughs> they know they can't accuse him of sin. They're aware of this reality. They know that, that there's nothing they have to say that would convince Christ or the, the people around that he was indeed being sinful. They can't accuse him of sin. They're aware of this. So what do they do? They attack his family. What a cheap shot. What a sorry move. <laughs> Essentially calling Jesus... And this, if this offends you, I'm sorry, but that is this you're essentially calling Jesus a bastard child, that he uh, doesn't even know his own father. <laughs> wow, how insulting. He doesn't know his father. Christ being ever godly and Christ-like, he gives such a great, great answer. I love his answer. <laughs> Jesus is teaching this multitude, and they're like, well, Abraham is our father, and and you don't even know your father, and... and <laughs> Jesus gives them this answer. Jesus says to them, If God were your father, you'd love me. <laughs> For I came from God. Gotcha. <laughs> For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. They're saying, we know our father. He said, me too. He's the devil. <laughs> you desire to do the devil's will. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father <laughs> of lies. <clears throat> then he, uh, over in, into, into verse 46, he asks the question of these. He, he wants to know. Can you convict me of sin? Which one of you convicts me guilty of sin? Or as the NIV puts it, which one of you can... can um, I'm sorry, I believe it's the ESV says that he... Which one of you convicts me of sin? And the NIV says, which one of you can prove me guilty of sin? He puts it out there. Prove it. Can you prove me guilty of sin? They can't. Christ attests to his own holiness. These men have nothing, and they know that. Christ knows that. So what he does, he, he presses on the question on them a little bit more. He challenges them to show them his sin. And they can't. 
because Christ is sinless, and he affirms his own sinless perfection, his own holiness. <clears throat> Actually, a little bit earlier in the chapter, he made a similar statement. Not only did he actively not sin, he also perfectly pleased the Father. So he, not only was he not committing sin, he was actively pleasing the Father, John eight twenty nine, And uh, he who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Here's what, uh, here's what Jerry Bridges had, has to say on this setting of Scripture. Such a positive declaration must include not only his actions, but also his attitudes and his motives. It is possible for us to do the right action from a wrong motive, but this does not please God. Holiness has to do with more than mere acts. Our motives must be holy. That is, arising from a desire to do something simply because it is the will of God. Our thoughts should be holy since they are known to God even before they're formed in our minds. Jesus Christ perfectly met these standards, and he did it for us. So Christ uh, is, is, is perfect, speaks of his own holiness, and he lives it out. He doesn't just make a claim that he can't back up. He does it. <clears throat> so the thing in, in our lives, um, when we look at Christ and say, you did this perfectly and you did it for me, we, we do rejoice in that. But as we grow in our own personal holiness, we ought to grow in awareness of Christ's holiness. Again, from the pursuit of holiness, it's not only that the, at the initial point of salvation that we need this assurance of, of holiness. In fact, the more we grow in holiness, the more we need assurance that the perfect righteousness of Christ is credited to us. This is true because a part of growing in holiness is the Holy Spirit's making us aware of our need of holiness. That hits. <laughs> So maybe maybe you've found yourself in the past or in the present. Uh, after many years of service to God, feeling stagnant, cold, or increasingly sinful. I'll put my hand up there. I have. And it's easy in these times to really become overwhelmed. Again, I'll put my hand up. <laughs> I've been there when I've wanted to grow in my walk with the Lord, but I don't feel that growth. And it's not like it was when I was younger, when I was in my teens, and and even on up through my 20s when I would pray and God felt near and dear and close. No, matter of fact, I have felt more distant from God uh, as time has gone on, and I've wondered, Lord, where are you? And as I grow in my connection with Christ, I realize that at one time could have been an emotional experience that sustained me, no longer sustains. That emotionality, that emotionalism is gone, and now I walk by faith, and I, and I see my own lack of holiness before me at all times, and I say, God, help me to grow in grace. Help me to grow in, in holiness. We can even begin to doubt our salvation. Been there. But I want to give us a little bit of encouragement. I mentioned Isaiah earlier. He felt that. Um, he, felt, he felt that woe is me feeling. But it was in that vision, that, that place of humility, that understanding and acceptance of his own lack of holiness, that the angel comes and takes the coal off of the altar and tells him, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. As you grow in holiness, you may become more and more aware of your sinfulness, but take courage your sin is atoned for in Christ. He was our perfect holiness. I don't mean to sound preachy there. <laughs> and, I, and I knew when I was going over these, these show notes and through this episode that, that much of this would come across as, as sort of preachy and more, more of sermonizing than it would as podcast or as a Bible lesson. Uh, but... You know that's that's okay. I hope it's okay with you with you guys that are listening because we need to be aware. <laughs> we need to be aware of our sinfulness. Now, there's a ditch on both sides of this road. There's the one side that's legalistic and and self righteous that says I don't need. I, I'm good. I'm holy. There's the other side that says Woe is me. I'm a wretch. I'm a wretch. I'm a wretch. And I find that in the incredibly far right uh, reformed Calvinistic theologies that exist, to where it's almost as though we are so holy. 
that we are not able to even be saved. And I think that that puts in people's hearts and minds a, a sense of despair. And while I believe in the depravity of man, I believe in the sinfulness of man, the inability of man to save himself, I believe all of those things. Um, I, I, I want to operate outside of the extremes and come to a place where I just recognize how sinful I am and the constant need of the grace of God, but, but, but find peace and security inside of that grace and inside of that atoning work in my life. Know that it is by grace I'm saved through faith, not of me. I'm not the one doing it. Christ is the one saving and keeping and find real peace in that. Uh, he's our holiness. Jesus is. <clears throat> so Satan's aware of Christ's holiness. So remember this, Satan's a better theologian than you or I will ever be. Uh, he just is. I remember hearing John Piper not long ago, and I, I don't know when he initially said it, but I saw the video not long ago where uh, Piper was talking about how that you could go and spend 10 hours a day every day of your life studying and reading theology and could really develop a well-rounded understanding of God and still not really know him. Uh, that's the devil. <laughs> that's the devil. He's a better theologian than we will ever be. He knows everything that I've said to this point to be truth. He does. So what he does is he wants to attack us uh, for our lack of holiness. I can't even tell you the many times that I've been in a church service in my life, and I've heard somebody say, you know, the devil's attacking me, the devil is fighting me, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. First of all, we talk about the devil way too much. Holiness churches talk about the devil way too much. I mean, the dude lost. (laughs) <laughs> he lost. Why do we keep dragging him back into this fight? He's done. I'm not saying we should be foolish. Be sober. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But Satan knows he has already been defeated. So when he attacks you about holiness, take heart. Take courage. For one, because he's a liar. Uh, the father of lies. We just read about that in John 8. The truth of our acceptance uh, by God through the righteousness of Christ may seem so elementary that you wonder why we stress it. It's because we need to dwell on it to thwart the attacks of Satan. The Holy Spirit makes us more aware of our lack of holiness, and this is why, to stimulate us to deeper yearning and striving for holiness. But Satan will attempt to use the Holy Spirit's work to discourage us. So possibly you have been in a place where you have struggled and have wondered, God, am I in the right, am I doing the right things here? That's a good place to be. Don't let Satan use that against you. Realize the Holy Spirit is working in you. Satan is aware of Christ's holiness. Satan is aware of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Satan is aware of all these things, and he wants to get in there and muddy the waters, confuse that, make you feel bad and horrible, and so that his end goal Remember what Jesus said? The thief comes not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. Um, so, so his end goal is, is to wreak havoc over our lives. I don't mean to misabuse context there. So for those of you that, that, that are uh, scholars, don't, don't just give me a pass, okay? <laughs> uh, but we know that we have an enemy that, that wants to attack us. So Jerry Bridges tells a story in the book about, about this time in his life when he too was uh, struggling and he would take a long drive once a week, once a month to teach a Bible lesson. And it was on that drive back and forth that he began to be very aware of his own lack of holiness in his life. And, and Satan began to attack him, um, causing him to wonder if he was even actually saved, if his conversion was genuine or true or real, and he didn't know. So this is what he did to thwart those attacks and to push those attacks away. Let me just say, it doesn't always require some explosion. It doesn't always require some earth-shaking, earth-shattering moment in an altar service or a camp meeting or any of those things. This is one way that we can thwart the attacks of Satan, and Bridges did it this way. He began to sing an old hymn. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to sing it. I wish I could sing, but I can't. But sing the words, just as I am, without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. I come to thee. So, 
here's the deal. Satan knows about the holiness of Christ. If you're a believer, Satan knows of that work in you. He understands your security. He knows Romans 8. He knows that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing separates. So he attacks us. But you as a believer have the distinct privilege of being able to come boldly before the throne of God to find grace, obtain mercy, to help in those times of need. So what I want to encourage you with here today is stop talking about stop talking about the freaking devil. <laughs> stop giving him all the daggum credit in your life. <laughs> and look to Christ just as you are without one plea that thy blood was shed for me and thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come. In conclusion this is what the pursuit of holiness looks like. It's not a pursuit of standard. It's not a pursuit of lifestyle. It's not a pursuit of isolationism. It's not a pursuit of taking myself out of and away from everything. It's not a pursuit of righteousness. It's not a pursuit of, of do more, be more, act more. It's none of those things. The pursuit of holiness is a pursuit of Christ. And I trust that you as a believer can, can find that peace that, that, that you're longing for. A couple passages from the book, and we'll wrap this one up. Clearly, then, the sinless, holy life of Jesus is meant to be an example for us. Consider, then, his statement, I always do what pleases him. Do we dare take that as our personal goal in life? Are we willing to scrutinize all our activities, all our goals, all our plans, all of our uh, impulsive actions in the light of this statement, I am doing this to please God? <laughs> And I want to be careful there because I know growing up in a fundamentalist culture that, that for me that meant don't do anything. No, it means do things, but do them for God. Everything we do for the glory of God. Whether we eat or drink, let it be for the glory of God. Whatever conviction issue that you're wrestling with, I'm not telling you to do it or not do it. I'm not telling you that. What I'm telling you is do things for the glory of God, whatever it is. And, and I have several things in my mind right now. I just don't know that it would be wisdom to actually put those out there in the world um, because I don't know the things that you guys are struggling with, but I am not here to tell you not to do something. I'm here to say, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And I mean whatever you do. Eat your breakfast for the glory of God. Put your socks on for the glory of God. Uh, go to the movies for the glory of God. You know, Eat your meals for the glory of God. Be involved in relationships for the glory of God. Um, have conversations with coworkers for the glory of God. Hang out with your friends for the glory of God. <laughs> Read your Bible for the glory of God. Go to Walmart for the glory of God. Go on vacation for the glory of God. Do do things. Do them, but do them for the glory of God. I'm not telling you to hold back. I was always taught, don't do, don't do, don't do. If you have a question, don't do it. I'm not going to give you that advice. That's that's dangerous and foolish advice. I'm going to say, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. I think if we ask this question, am I doing this to please God, uh, we can maybe sometimes start to squirm a little bit, feel uncomfortable. We know that we do some things, good things of themselves, uh, for, our, for ourselves rather than for the glory of God. And we do uh, things strictly for our own pleasure without any regard for the glory of God. I think that's where we miss it. We want to do things for the glory of God. You know, my little girl... She just finished her first season of basketball and did a great job. You know, if Maddie ever sees this video, Maddie, you did, you did great, sweetheart. Um, but I would try to have conversation with her and say, look, sweetie, it's not about how many passes, the, the good passes you make. It's not about how many points you score. It's not even about winning or losing. It's about doing this for the glory of God and representing him well on and off the court. That, I think that needs to be our motive. And my little girl was a stud on the court. <laughs> Uh, one final quote in the words of the 19th century uh, Scottish theologian John Brown. Holiness does not consist in mystical speculations. 
enthusiastic fervors, or uncommanded austerities. It consists in thinking as God thinks and willing as God wills. Neither does holiness mean, as is so often thought, adhering to a list of do's and don'ts. Mostly don'ts. When Christ came into the world, he said, I've come to do your will, O God. This is the example we are to follow in all our thoughts, all our actions, in every part of our character. The ruling principle that motivates and guides us should be the desire to follow Christ in doing the will of the Father. This is the high road that we must follow in the pursuit of holiness. So, friend, a listener, whoever you may be, do this. When you're done with this episode, turn this thing off. Take a moment, rest, breathe in. Find peace in Christ. If you're struggling with sin, repent right then and there. Trust the forgiveness of God. Turn away from that thing and turn to God. If you're curious... Should I or should I not do whatever the thing may be? Ask yourself if you can honor God in the doing of that thing. Ask yourself that. Ask God that. And then rest. Rest in Christ. Rest in peace, knowing that Christ is our holiness. The things we do are not the things that make us holy. Christ is our holiness. All right? Guys, that's going to do it for this one. I'm glad you tuned in uh, to the Lost Mission podcast. Till next time, grace, peace. I'll catch you later. <laughs>